Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're here with another video to help you improve your chess game. Uh, a lot of people have heard that uh, for about five and a half years, I taught Howard Stern. Still keep in touch with Howard, but I don't teach him anymore. And I thought I'd show you a couple games of his. Uh, if it takes too little time to show you his immortal game, I might throw in the second game here, or I might make another video. Haven't decided, but we'll see. But the first game I'm going to show you is Howard Stern's Immortal Game. So before I show you the game, it's a very short game. We have a little bit of time. So let me tell you how this came about. Um, the year was 2006, and I was sitting right here upstairs, and the phone rang. And I picked it up, and there was a deep voice, and it said, uh, Hi, this is Howard Stern. I'm looking for a chess coach. I think maybe you could help me. And... The first thing I did was I tried to process the voice timbre because people's voices over the phone don't sound the same that they do on the radio. And I tried to figure out, is this voice that's calling me the Howard Stern? Does it sound like it could be really be him? And it sort of did. And I said, uh, uh, I'll be glad to help you, Mr. Stern. Uh, uh, how did you find me? And he said, oh, oh, I just Googled chess teacher and you're the first name that came up. And I said, well, are you looking for someone to teach you live who, you know, lives in Manhattan? And he said, uh, that would be good. And I said, okay, I know a few teachers up that way. I'm sure I can help you find someone. Uh, and I said, uh, are you any good with computers? And he said, yep. And he sa I said, well, if you have a couple minutes, let me show you how I teach people over the Internet. And he said, okay. I said, you know, go to the chessclub.com and download their Blitzen software, which was their main soft, software for the ICC in those days. And he did. And I said, open that up. And I said, uh, you know, you sign on as a guest and you can follow Philly Tutor. Now, I think later on they fixed it so the guests couldn't follow people. But I think in those days he could. So anyway, so uh, so he, he followed Philly Tutor and I started showing him a board and I said, here, you know, I, I talk to people over the phone while I'm showing them the positions on the board. And he said, well, this is easy. I could take lessons from you. And I said, well, I'd be honored to do that. And uh, he said, uh, sure, let's, let's, set up a, let's set up a time to do that. So that was the start of a really nice friendship between me and Howard. Anyway, a couple years later, Howard played the game that I'm about to show you. And to put this game in context, Howard's style, which is more uh, conducive to what I'll show in the second game, uh, is a very solid style. Howard doesn't play like crazy chess. He plays fairly solid. Now, when I first started teaching him, his ICC rating was about 900, which ICC ratings were about 150 points higher than USCF. So he was equivalent to about USCF 750. But I worked with him and we worked with him, and Howard worked, you know, worked really well. He, he worked on his game. And after a couple of years, he was a pretty pretty decent player. And in fact, the game that I'm going to show you was played in 2008. So it was only after two years, and his ICC rating was already up to 1,600, which is about 1,450 USCF. And in this game, Howard was black, and he was paired with an ICC 1,900 player, which would be about 1,750 USCF. All right, so here's how the game went. Uh, his opponent was white and played D4. Howard played knight f6, his opponent played c4, and Howard played his favorite e5. I don't think he plays that anymore, but he played the Budapest Gambit. And uh, at the time, he knew it pretty well, and we went over some of the main lines. And here his opponent makes a mistake. He makes a positional mistake. The right thing to do for white is to take the pawn, and after black plays knight to g4, which is the main line, knight e4 is the main sideline, White should guard the pawn. I think the main line is to play bishop f4, then knight c6, knight f3, then bishop to b4 check, knight to d knight to d2, and then queen e7 getting the pawn back. But white can win the bishop pair by playing a3 because the bishop doesn't have any great places to go, and white will eventually get the advantage of the bishop pair giving back the pawn. In this game, after d4, knight f6, c4, e5, white plays the positional mistake d5. White gets space out of d5, but he makes 
himself very weak on the dark squares in the middle of the board. So what move would you play here for black to take advantage of that? Black plays the most natural move on the board. Howard plays bishop to c5. And now black's just doing well. He's got control of the dark squares in the center. Notice white is occupying the white squares, but he can't, he, he, with his pawns, but he can't occupy the light squares with his pieces. In fact, the only light square in the middle that, you know, doesn't have a white pawn on it is controlled by the, the dark knight. So here, black is controlling the dark squares and white's not really controlling the light squares. So black's already better. He's got two pieces out. White has none. And, you know, let's ask Stockfish to evaluate this position. Mr. Stockfish, we have plenty of time here. We'll probably just do one game in each video. Stockfish says white is equal if he play if he deadens the diagonal here and plays e3 with the idea that he's just going to get his knight out get his bishop out let's play the best moves for both sides here a little bit castles for black knight c3 for white black plays a5 a move that a lot of humans wouldn't consider just again trying to prevent later White from driving that bishop away. Also, it stops knight a4 from pushing the bishop off the diagonal because the bishop can always go back to a7. Not that the bishop necessarily wants to stay on that diagonal. And now it gives a3. And now, of course, the pawn on a5 is doing a good job stopping b4. d6, bishop d3. c6, breaking the pawns. Break move. A break move is a pawn move that attacks a pawn that can't just go past him. And here, of course, white can't. Knight g2 getting ready to castle. C takes d5. C takes d5. And now engine wants to play knight e8 with the idea of expanding on the king side. White tries to stop that with e4. And the engine actually suggests the interesting move. Queen h4 threatening f2. And then knight g3. And we've got about an equal position. Maybe black's ahead microscopically here. All right, let's go back to the game. So that's what white should do. He should just dull this diagonal. Instead, he makes a losing move. Believe it or not, it's only the fourth move of the game, but white's move is a losing move. Let's make the board bigger again. White plays h3. He's so afraid that knight g4 is going to attack the f2 square that he stops the knight from going there. And the general rule is you don't want to play moves like h3, a3, h6, a6 in the opening to prevent pieces from going there because you can always drive them away once they do. And here is no exception. H3 is not only a waste of time for white, but it also weakens the square G3 by taking a pawn off of it. Well, but how can black take advantage of that? So I think I was watching the game at the time. It's been a while. And I said to myself, gee, you know, I think maybe black can sacrifice here and really uh, create some problems for white. But I was startled when Howard actually did it because it was so against his style at, at the time, and in fact his style today, that I was surprised that he went for the gusto. Now I always tell my students, if you have a choice between a, an equal position and an unclear position, you should almost always, unless you're playing for $10,000 at the World Open, you should almost always choose the unclear position because you could learn something. And this... This would apply to this move if you don't really see how good the sacrifice is here. You know, and you see it and you say, well, I really can't figure this out. It might be worth trying so that later on you get a better feel for stuff like this. But if you're a good player, I don't think you would think this. You would calculate a few moves ahead and realize I have plenty of play for my piece. So black plays, bishop takes f2 check. When somebody takes a pawn like that, even if you think that king takes f2 is no good, you can't just play king d2 and just give him a pawn and end up losing castling rights anyway. You have to kind of hold your nose and say, let me take the bishop and maybe he'll misplay this. I think this attack is very dangerous, but maybe he'll misplay this attack. And, you know, at least I'll have a piece for my worries. But if you, if you play king d2 in this kind of position, then black has the better position and he has an extra pawn and he still has the attack. So it almost never makes sense when your opponent is sacrificing something to put him ahead in material 
that you don't take the sacrifice and put yourself ahead in material because otherwise you're just acquiescing to, to losing the game. Now obviously if king takes f2, you calculate he's going to mate you in two moves, then you're going to play king d2. But you, you don't just want to give pe people free material when the material was even to begin with, and now after he takes the, the piece, he's up material. All right, so white correctly plays, king takes f2, and of course, of course black plays knight e4 check with the idea that the knight is hitting these dark squares. Now we can see immediately that white can't tuck his king back away. If you're a beginner and you don't know why he can't tuck the king away, it might be a good idea to pause the video and look at king to e1 and see what you would do for black. And the hint is you always want to look at your checks, captures, and threats, and you want to look at your opponent's checks, captures, and threats. Well, it's pretty easy. If you play king to e1, then black only has one check, and because of this move h3, that check will win the game immediately. Queen h4 check. This is not what happened in the game, of course. g3 only legal move. Queen takes checkmate. g3 checkmate. So white is forced to come up. But once his king comes up, he's going to be a little bit of a punching bag. So the question is, where should he go up? He only has two legal moves to go up. King f3 and king e3. If you're playing white in a position like this, you want to take your time and try to calculate them the best you can. Let's have Stockfish run his analysis on those two moves to show you how much of a difference there might be. All right, Stockfish, King E3 versus King F3. Look at that difference. Okay, in both cases, Black's winning, but the difference on how easily he's winning is monstrous. If you play King E3 and Black plays all his best moves, then White's down three and a half pawns, which is plenty enough to win the game. That's why Bishop takes F2 check was a sound sacrifice, because whether white takes or not, he's losing. In fact, let's go back a move and show you. Right here, Stockfish says you have to take the, the bishop. You're only down 3.75. If you play king to d2, now you're down 8.4 after something like knight e4 check, king c2, knight g3. And now most weaker players might try to save the rook, but if you save the rook, he'll take the knight and hit the rook, and the rook's trapped anyway. So black's just winning a ton of material already here. All right, back to the game. So after king takes knight here, white should play king e3. He played king f3 in the game. So let's take a look at the, at the computer's line if white plays the best move. Let's make the board a little bigger here. And we'll play the best move for both sides for a few moves, just to show what kind of attack black can get. King to e3. The engine says black can play queen h4. He can play knight g3. Engine says knight g3 is a little better. And now, suppose he tries to save the rook, and he plays rook h2. Then it gives queen g5 check. And if you play king f3... Engine just wants to play queen g6. And now if knight d2, queen f6 check. Can't take the knight because queen f4 is mate. King e3, queen b6 check. c5, queen takes c5 check. And you get the idea. All right, but he doesn't have to play rook h2. Suppose he just plays... King d3 and says, go ahead and take the rook. The engine says it's 50-50 between taking the rook or bringing the queen into the attack first. It gives queen f6, then maybe e4. And again, it's 50-50 between d6 and knight takes h1. We'll play d6 just to show you don't need to take the rook. Queen e1, now knight takes h1, and black's up by about three and a half pawns. Okay, so white should have played king to e3. Instead, he plays king to f3. And the nice thing about king to f3, from the white standpoint, is it stops the knight from going to g3 and, you know, winning the rook in a lot of those lines we just saw. The problem is, black only has one move that wins the game here, but it's such an obvious move, and... It wins the game. I mean, the, the evaluation is the best move is minus nine and a half, and the second best move is plus two. We call this a critical move. It's critical 
because if you play the right move, you're up by 13 and a half. If you play the wrong move, you're down by two. So right now there's like a 17 pawn difference between the best move and the second best move. You know, that's, that's about as critical as it gets, especially this early in the game. So of course, Howard plays the right move. He plays queen h4, threatening in some cases things like queen f2 check, king takes e4, f5 check, king, take, king takes e5, d6 checkmate. If you don't believe me, let's play a3 for white, a3 for white. Stockfish says queen g3 instead of queen f2. We can play queen here, king takes. Oh, well now on the pawn checks, he doesn't have to take the pawn. He can run this way. And then he's only just losing. Stockfish says, oh no, he's winning. So, so much for my analysis. No, queen g3 check is the move to keep the king off of the here. Now, same idea. f5 check. King takes f5. d6 check. King e4. Bishop f5 check, throwing the bishop out. King takes. Queen g6 Technique. mate. Okay. Shows you what I... <laughs> Shows you make one mistake in analysis and uh, you throw it all away. So, so yeah, queen g g6 check would would win if white does nothing. So white's not going to do nothing here. And what white does is he interferes with the queen's ability to guard the knight. White plays g4 so that he can threaten king takes e4 and then run toward the queen side. And now Howard again has only one move to win the game. Everything else loses. And he finds the right move. He plays f5. This does two things. It guards the knight, but it also is a kind of break move because, again, you know, pawn up to g5 is not possible. Queen to g3 is checkmate. mate and one. In fact, now that the knight's checkmate. guarded, I can play queen f2 checkmate also. And what black's going to do is he's either going to castle or play rook f8 and get the rook into the attack also. And that's going to be the end of white. So here with the knight guarded, as I said, checking with the queen is now a threat of mate. So white takes the pawn so that if the queen checks, he'll get a chance to take the knight. So now black just needs that one more piece in the game. Now what's funny is after the game, I gave this to the engine. And of course, I didn't have Stockfish 14 then. But the engine found that the best move, and still is the best move, is the move that I wouldn't even hardly consider here. I would look at castle or rook f8. Maybe I'd look at d6. Those would be my candidate moves. The best move here, believe it or not, is knight to a6. It's, uh, it's surprising that you would move a knight to the rim on the opposite side of the board of where all the action is. But to give you an idea, let's play a few moves and show. Well, Stockfish is saying white, white should just give up his queen with queen to e1. But no human would do that. So... Let's do something maybe reasonable. Let's say uh, maybe white tries to play, um, ooh, what would be a reasonable move here? He could play bishop e3 to stop the queen coming here. And if the queen checks here, he can take off the knight and he's okay. So let's try bishop e3. Stockfish says, well, now you can castle. Now that he's taken the square away. And if he tries to run around here with rook h2 then rook takes f5 check bishop f4 and it's going to be made in a couple let's try a different move let's say he plays bishop d2 so that now he can play queen e1 and guard the dark squares well now that he can't run to that square queen checks king here and here comes that knight checkmate. in the game checkmate knight c5 so now we're starting to see why Knight to a6 is such a good move. All right, so knight a6, a move that I'm almost sure that I would not have found, but the good news is this is not as critical. Black has lots of winning moves in this position. So knight a6 is not the only winning move. In the game, Howard played rook f8, and I said to myself, well, maybe he should have castled, but it probably doesn't make any difference. And now rook takes f5 check, king to e3, and then a few more checks, like queen f4 check, and the game's going to be toast. And here white makes a mistake. Let's play the best move for both sides here just to show you how bad it is. Stockfish says white should play knight c3. Black gets the rook into the attack. King to e3. And now queen f4 check is probably not right because after king d3, the bishop is hitting the queen. So we can't just 
fork the king and the queen here because after knight f2, king c2, if we take the queen, he'll take my queen. And if I take the time to save the queen, he can save his queen. And even though black's winning here, uh, the game's not over. So instead of queen f4, the engine suggests just fork the queen and the rook. And now if he pins the knight to the queen, then we can give a queen check. Maybe queen d4 checkmate would be a good move if he plays queen e1. Engine says he should counterattack the queen with knight f3. But now knight takes d1 as check. And of course that makes all the difference in the world. Knight takes d1. Queen takes c4. And black's way up in material and he's winning. All right, so in the game, white gay gave up pretty quickly here. White played king to e3, and now I was watching the game and I said, oh, queen f4 check forces king d3, and then after the knight check and the king moves, I can check him again with the queen and then take his queen. But black misses that, and he just plays rook takes f5. That's the bad news. The Stockfish says knight a6, our favorite knight move there is made in nine a move that again i'm sure i wouldn't have found i would have played queen f4 check and stockfish says that's the second best move howard played rook takes f5 plenty good enough to win the game poor white just can't get his pieces developed in the game he attacks the queen well you're forcing the queen to find the winning combination now so the queen plays queen f4 check which also guards the knight there's only one legal move king to d3 and now Howard forks the king and the queen. Now you might say, well, we have the same problem again. The queen's hanging. The problem is the king doesn't have anywhere good to go. <clears throat> if he goes king to c3, then knight takes d1 as check, and you don't have time to take black's queen. The only other move you can play is to play king to c2. But now, instead of taking the queen, which would be a big, big, big mistake, you want to play the in-between move, of queen checks and and every queen check will work here every safe queen check will work queen takes c4 check and when he gets out of check you can take his queen queen to e4 check works also because he can't put the queen in the way because you take it with a knight and again when he gets out of check however he does it let's say king to d2 then you could just take off the queen and you win so white realized in this position that after after uh knight check that even though he's hitting the queen he's not going to be able to trade queens he could have played one more move just to see if howard would throw in that check but because you know black's played a pretty good game and white's a decent player and he sees that this is completely hopeless he resigns and and the engine says yeah you're down 8.6 pawns that that'll do it so let's go through the game real quickly again S slow motion instant replay maybe we should call it fast motion instant replay We'll, we'll turn off the engine make the board bigger. Let's show it from Howard's point of view. Flip the board. Okay, d4, knight f6, c4, e5, Budapest gambit. d5, not a good way to decline the gambit. Bishop c5, h3, actually the losing move of the game, believe it or not, already on move four for white. Bishop takes f2 check, completely against Howard's uh, normal style of play. King takes, knight checks. King f3, queen h4, only move, but good enough to win. g4, f5, only move, but good enough to win. Pawn takes. Now black has a couple ways he can play it. I think knight a6 was the number one move. He plays rook f8, good enough. King e3. Here queen f4 check already would be winning. Rook takes f5, that's winning too. Knight f3, forcing the queen to move. Queen f4 check, king d3, knight f2 check. And white resigns in only 11 moves. So you play someone 300 points higher than you, and you have black, and you win in 11 moves. And we're not talking about, you know, your rating is 500 and his rating is 800, and you're both terrible. You know, this is where Howard's ICC rating was 1,600 after a couple years of, of uh, playing and a couple years of lessons. And white's rating was 1,900 ICC. And again, you have to subtract the 150 points for FIDE USCF. But, you know, these are decent players, and unfortunately for White, after H3, Howard played a real nice game and, and beat him, and uh, I kind of call this Howard Stern's Immortal Game. Maybe in the next video I'll show you another Howard Stern victory where he, he played much more in his normal style, 
And he found a really brilliant move that I, when he played it, I thought was was pretty terrible. But then the more I stared at it, the more I realized, wow, is this really a great move? <laughs> Am I missing something? And it turned out it really was a good move. All right, we're going to see you next time. If you uh, enjoyed the video, you can like the video, you can subscribe. But the best thing you can do is tell your friends about the channel, Dan Heisman Chess. And we'll be back next time with another game. See you then. Bye.